Thank you very much. Is the mic working? Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to uh, speak before a very different audience, uh, my very first uh, strings meeting. Um, so the title is slightly different. I'll talk about condensed matter applications of gauge gravity duality. Um, so given my own background, I, I thought the best thing I could do was uh, give a perspective from condensed matter physics of what are some of the interesting questions uh, that can be addressed and that could possibly be useful uh, in studying real experimental systems, uh, give you my opinion on the status of the field, uh, and, uh, uh, and also summarize some of the things that have been achieved and, and, and the promising avenues for future research. Uh, so I should uh, begin by mentioning uh, some of my recent collaborators, Rob Myers, Ajay Singh, Marcus Mueller, Lisa House, uh, Max Metlitsky, and uh, Sean Hartnell. Um, so the field, although not very old, is extremely active, and uh, there's, uh, there's no way I can review or, or, uh, all, all the different things that have been done. I'm not particularly knowledgeable about certain aspects of the field myself, uh, but I've put up here a list of recent review articles by others, mo most of them string theorists, uh, Gupser, Hartnell, Herzog, Horowitz, uh, Hong Liu to appear, McGreevy, uh, Take Nagi, uh, and a recent article by myself. Um, so, so with this, I, I, uh, you know, I hope you forgive me if I give you a more parochial perspective uh, on on the aspects that interest me most uh, in this area. I should also mention very briefly uh, this book on Tasi lectures, uh, which overlaps with some of the things I'm going to say. All right. So, so my talk's going to be roughly divided into two parts, um, and I look at two broadly different types of systems. Uh, the first part are systems. Uh, for which the application of ADS CFT correspondence is rather natural uh, because you have uh, a CFT uh, being realized generically in certain condensed matter systems. So in this case, the field is relatively well established, and I think the prospects for actual experimental tests uh, are, are not remote. I mean, in the next few years, hopefully, uh, there can be progress in this direction. Uh, the second part of the talk, which is somewhat more speculative, uh, looks more broadly at systems which are not, not necessarily conformal, uh, but could be obtained by perturbing a conformal fixed point, in particular by adding a chemical potential. So here we lead, re deal broadly with the class of systems I'll call compressible quantum matter, uh, where there's, it's a field of uh, very active research in the last few years, even the last few months. Uh, I'll try to summarize the status of where things stand uh, and, and what are the open and difficult problems that remain to be understood. So these two classes of problems in the first, if you attempt them uh, in the simplest uh, approach, lead naturally to gravity in some simple geometries. And for conformal field theories, that's of course just the anti uh geometry. And I'll focus mainly in two plus one dimensions. Uh, and so there, it'll be anti Desider four. And if you go to finite temperature, uh, there's a Schwarzschild black hole uh, associated with that. If you do the corresponding uh, analysis for systems at finite density, uh, then you get a reisner nordstrom black hole, both at zero and finite temperature, uh, and a near-horizon ge geometry at low temperatures, which looks like ADS2 cross R2. So this is a ubiquitous feature of many studies uh, in, in the past few years, and so I'm going to spend a fair bit of time trying to give my perspective and in interpreting uh, what this geometry means and what are some of its shortcomings, really. Uh, and so now I can fill in the outline of the rest of my talk, uh, of various uh, topics I'm going to cover. So let me begin with part one, where, uh, where things are relatively well established, uh, where I'll talk about uh, systems uh, which are intrinsically conformal, uh, and therefore it's very natural to think about applications uh, using gauge, gra gauge gravity duality. So one of the simplest systems that generically realizes a conformal field theory uh, is shown here. You just take a bunch of bosons, in this case, uh, rubidium atoms, and put them in a periodic potential. Uh, so as you change the depth of the periodic potential, the bosons can go from a trapped state or an insulator to a superfluid with a tunnel freely uh, between the minima of the periodic potential. Uh, so now you can ask how this quantum phase transition occurs. And in two dimensions, generically, for bosons with short-range interactions, uh, that's a conformal field theory. So very briefly, if I describe the boson by this famous Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, with bosons hopping with matrix element T on a lattice, uh, 
and repulsion U, uh, then at low energies, uh, this turns out to have a relativistic field theoretical structure. That may seem surprising, but here's a very simple reason for it. Uh, the relativistic field theory emerges when you have an integer number of bosons. In particular, the number of bosons uh, in this case is equal to the number of traps. So if this is your vacuum, when U is very large, uh, there are two types of excitations. There are particle excitations, which I call psi dagger, and hole excitations, where I remove a particle. Now, because your density is integer, uh, the density of particles must equal the density of holes, and that, in the end, is responsible for the relativistic structure. So near the critical point between the superfluid and the insulator, you should write down a low-energy field theory. Uh, the relevant terms all have a relativistic structure. Uh, of course, the velocity v here is not the velocity of light. It's a velocity of sound or, or, pro or propagation in the superfluid. So now as you tune this coupling g, uh, which is related to the repulsion between the bosons, you realize a critical point. So as a function of g, you have a quantum phase transition at zero temperature between a superfluid and an insulator. And in two dimensions, this critical point uh, is in fact known with very good evidence to be a conformal field theory, uh, in fact, the famous Wilson-Fisher fixed point. Okay, so we understand a lot about this using methods developed uh, starting with the original work of Wilson and Fisher, uh, but if you start to think about the system, uh, not at zero temperature, but at finite temperature, you immediately run into rather difficult questions. So here I've, I have divided the finite temperature phase diagram into blue and, and orange regions. The blue regions are in some sense the well understood regions where you have a, a, a sim relatively simple ground state uh, and with relatively simple excitations, in this case vortices and over here just particles and holes about the insulator. And you can use traditional methods of condensed matter physics to describe the dynamics at finite temperature of these excitations. But in the intermediate pink region, uh, none of those methods work. And really the best way to think about this region uh, is as if you took the system at its, conformal, at its critical fixed point, which is described by conformal field theory. Uh, and then there's a range of temperature and G where the leading description is simply the real-time dynamics of the strongly interacting conformal field theory. So that, that turns out to be a very difficult problem, which has resisted answering some very basic questions uh, from the traditional condensed matter methods. Uh, so one of the basic characteristics of the regime uh, unlike conformal field theories in two, one plus one dimensions, is this generic conformal field theory uh, equilibrates on its own. That if you perturb it a little bit, it will relax back to thermal equilibrium, and we relax back to thermal equilibrium in a very short time. Basically, the characteristic uh, time is just the inverse temperature itself in units of Planck's constant, and the C is an unknown, in general, universal constant, which doesn't depend on the details uh, of the interactions between the Hamilton, uh, between the atoms, but just depends on the universality class of the conformal field theory. So even for the very simplest systems, uh, we don't know the value of C, which of course will depend to some extent on precisely how you define this time tau. Uh, but one consequence of this is that various quantities, for example, the electrical conductivity, are also determined just by Planck's constant. So the, con the electrical conductivity will be just one over Planck's constant, times another universal constant. And a corresponding statement, perhaps more familiar to this audience, is if you looked at the shear viscosity, then there the relative figure of merit is the ratio of the shear viscosity to the entropy density, and that also is given by Planck's constant in general times the universal constant of order one. Uh, of course, here, as uh, Dom Sohn and Corabetra showed, uh, you can compute this universal constant for a large class of superconformal field theories, and surprisingly, that turns out to be a relatively good estimate, as best as we can tell, uh, of even systems that are quite far from supersymmetry. Okay, so let me now go back to the electrical transport and ask a, a, a somewhat deeper question. In particular, let me try to think about the frequency dependence of the conductivity. Now, one way to think about this is just use traditional condensed matter methods and ap apply the Boltzmann equation. And roughly speaking, you'll get some equation like this, uh, describing the Brownian motion of the particle and hole excitations in some applied electric field. And from this, you get this Drude form for the frequency dependence of the conductivity, uh, 
uh, where tau c is of order of the inverse temperature. Uh, so that would describe perhaps the low-frequency hydrodynamic relaxation uh, of the electrical current. And then at high frequency, you can use conformal invariance to argue that there's just some uh, spectral density of order unity for absorption of high frequency radiation. So from this, you'd come up with a picture like this for the frequency dependence of the conductivity, uh, going from a Drudo peak at low frequencies to some conformal result at high frequency with the characteristic scale of, of, the, of temperature itself. However, this picture for describing transport at the critical point is based on an approximation. It's based on our intuition that the relevant excitations are the particles and holes of the insulator. But you could equally well have started on this side and tried to do a theory of the excitations of this phase as a way to approach the critical point. There you would say the relevant excitations are vortices, and in 2 plus 1 dimension, these are just point particles, so you could equally well write down a Boltzmann equation for the vortices. Now, in terms of vortices, if you're trying to think about transport, uh, there's a one basic result. Uh, the vortice, for a vortex, a flowing vortex creates a voltage, not a current, uh, so current and voltage are interchanged, and as a consequence, the physical conductivity is the resistivity of the vortices. So if I apply this argument to vortices, I would conclude that this frequency-dependent result for the conductivity shouldn't look like this. It should, have, it should be the inverse of it, because I'm really computing the resistivity of the vortices uh, being related to the conductivity. And the surprising answer is that for the Bose-Hubbard model, this very basic model of condensed matter physics, we don't really know which is the correct picture, uh, because this problem really can't be addressed numerically either, uh, because of the famous sign problem and difficulties in analytic continuation at low frequency. Um, so whether the answer looks like this or like this, for the very simplest conformal field theory in two dimensions, we don't really know. Now, of course, you can try to use the traditional methods of the 1 over n expansion or the epsilon expansion, and this is what we did a long time ago. And you come up with a picture that favors uh, the particle interpretation uh, in a big way with very strong frequency dependence. Uh, but that's clearly a consequence of where you started thinking about the problem. Okay, so, so if the, here I pose then a, a rather basic questions about a very simple, strongly interacting system uh, in condensed matter physics. So now let me turn to what uh, uh, ADS CFT, CFT has to do, say for this. So what the strategy here is, well, let's just take some strongly interacting conformal field theory uh, in 2 plus 1 dimension and, and see if there's some systematic way you can analyze its transport uh, using gauge gravity duality. Okay. Uh, so, the, so the basic actor in all of these analysis is, as I said earlier, the ADS4 Schwarzschild black brain. Uh, and in the very simplest picture, you can just think of this as the classical solution uh, of, of this simple Einstein action uh, with a cosmological constant. Uh, so the picture here is that your 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum system, say these bosons near the superfluid insulator transition, uh, is at the boundary of the space here, and its low energy dynamics at finite temperature is related to the uh, to excitations near, near the horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole. And things like the conductivity, uh, as Sohn taught us, of, of the system over here are related to how various uh, electromagnetic and gravity perturbations uh, interact with the black hole horizon. So, so if you now want to think about charge transport uh, in, in the boundary theory, that's related to a dual gauge field that lives in the bulk. So let's just take the very simplest action for the dual gauge field. Uh, again, in the large end limit, you can just focus on a single abelian gauge field. Uh, and this is dual then to the conserved charge uh, on the boundary theory. Uh, but more generally, if you want to look at a wide class of theories, you can think of this as some sort of uh, uh, gradient expansion in the low energy physics on the gravitational space. So why don't we just go ahead and add the next term. Uh, and this was analysis done by Rob Myers and Ajay Singh. And what they showed is that at fourth order derivative, there's only one additional term up to some reparameterization freedom that you have. Uh, and was characterized by a single constant gamma dimensionless, which had to be less than 1 12th. So for, for, from my perspective, we can think of this limited range of gamma 
as some tuning parameter between different uh, conformal fixed points. And in fact, gamma equals zero is precisely the large end limit of the ABGM uh, conformal field theory. OK, so now you can try to compute the conductivity as a function of gamma, and you get a very physical and beautiful result. So what you find is that for gamma positive, you get a picture face favoring the particle interpretation of transport at the critical point with a due to peak, but a rather small peak at low frequencies. And for gamma negative, you get a picture favoring the vortex interpretation. Uh, and so here's a prediction as a, with one free parameter as a function of gamma. And it's a challenge to the field then is to see whether this works reasonably for the Bose-Hubbard model and what the value of gamma is. Uh, we don't really know the answer to that question. Uh, what we do know is that the, uh, the ABGM theory in the large end limit is gamma equals zero, and that splits the difference between particles and vortices. It has a certain S-duality in the large end limit, uh, and, and that's why the conductivity is frequency independent. OK, so that's a summary of, uh, I think, a reasonably well-defined calculation that's taught us something uh, and open a whole bunch of other questions we can address on even a relatively simple system uh, where we're looking at finite temperature transport of system with strong interactions. Now, there's been many other studies uh, in, uh, uh, along the same direction, uh, well, using the same basic action, looking at very different issues, which I don't have time to review. Uh, so there are studies uh, use, where you add Chern-Simons terms, and this breaks parity and time reversal and has natural connections to critical points in quantum Hall systems. Uh, people have proposed that you could even measure shear viscosity uh, in strongly interacting systems like graphene, uh, and perhaps they are also given by the uh, KSS bound or near that bound. Uh, people have looked at nonlinear transport. Uh, I just described linear transport in my discussion. And there are extensions to topological insulators. Uh, and I think many people are now working on looking at non-equilibrium questions, which are certainly much more, much more difficult. Uh, so in terms of experiments on the kind of things that I've discussed so far, unfortunately, there's relatively little, partly because there were very few theoretical predictions. Uh, this, for example, this is just an example. I show you this without going into any details. The frequency dependence of the conductivity uh, at the critical point between two quantum Hall states, uh, which is, in fact, this little peak here, and perhaps if, you, if uh, there were studies an analogous to this, uh, where you look at the frequency and temperature dependence carefully, uh, there could possibly be tests of some of the uh, ADS CFD based approaches uh, that I've presented so far. And this would be in the same spirit that Super Yang Mills has been so useful uh, in discussions of the quark gluon plasma. OK, so that's the end of the first part of my discussion, where, as I said, I focused on systems which in a sense are at zero density. They're, they're, they have equal number of particles and holes, uh, and that very naturally often leads to relativistic structure in the low energy theory, and where application of gauge gravity duality uh, is not a big surprise in a sense, with the benefit of hindsight. But much of the work in the last two or three years has been really looking at a much more difficult problem, which is the problem of compressible quantum matter. Uh, so let me, I'll begin rather now again by taking a detour into condensed matter methods to give you uh, my perspective from, as a condensed matter physicist of what we expect from weak coupling theory, what are the possible phases and what are some of their properties. And now it's possible that there's some entirely new types of strong coupling phases we don't know about that gauge gravity duality is going to teach us. Uh, but, but whether that's true or not, uh, we do believe there's a certain set of constraints any such new states must satisfy, and, and I'll try to present some of those constraints. So what do I mean by compressible quantum matter? Here's a, a very simple definition. Take any strongly interacting uh, quantum system to define on the continuum, bosons or fermions, uh, or gauge fields, whatever, and the only thing I require that there's a conserved U1 charge, Q, uh, which commutes with the Hamiltonian. And I'm going to look at systems in dimension d greater than 1. So that's, OK, still very general. Uh, so what do we mean we have compressible? Well, compressible is simple means that at zero temperature, not at finite temperature, where compressibility is kind of trivial, but at zero temperature, I look at the expectation value of Q, uh, 
as a function of some parameter, which I call mu, the chemical potential, which couples to the Hamiltonian, which adds linearly to the Hamiltonian. So H goes to H minus mu Q. And, and the basic characteristic of a compressible system is that as you vary mu, the expectation value of Q changes smoothly uh, and analytically. That's it. So that seems like a very general and broad definition. Uh, and it's hard to believe that you couldn't find many, many different systems uh, that obey this. Uh, turns out, in condensed matter, we know only a few, and I'm basically going to list all of them right here. So just to be clear, let's take uh, the very simplest system, which is also a conformal field theory, uh, massless direct fermions, uh, as we described graphene, for example. If I turn on a chemical potential, then, then this is indeed compressible. And what happens is the electrons occupy these states, and now you see one of the key characteristics of the system, that there's a Fermi surface. So uh, there's a line in momentum space here, which is a circle, which separates the occupied and unoccupied uh, states. Uh, and that Fermi surface is what changes in size as you change mu. And in fact, in graphene, of course, we know what happens near the Fermi surface. We, we, it's something called a Fermi liquid, and I want to distinguish those two concepts. Uh, the, the additional property of a Fermi liquid, in addition to a Fermi surface, is that the only low energy excitations of a Fermi liquid are the quasi-particle excitations across that surface, and that allows us to, to bound the strength of the interaction uh, just from phase space considerations between those, those quasi-particles. Okay, so there's something called a Luttinger relation, which then very naturally constrains uh, the area of that enclosed by that Fermi surface to the total charge density Q. So more formally, I should have mentioned the Fermi surface is defined as follows. Just take the inverse of the Green's function at zero frequency. It'll vanish at some momentum K. And if you have a rotational invariance, it'll be a circle. And that, that defines Kf. So now you compute the area enclosed by Kf, which is pi Kf squared. And modulo some phase space factor that I'm going to drop is just equal to mod Q. So this is believed to be valid uh, to all orders and perturbation theory, certainly, and the arguments perhaps even beyond that, uh, that this relation holds, uh, and it certainly, as far as we can tell, holds in, holds in graphene and uh, all common metals uh, and, and really most system studies in condensed matter physics. Okay, so that's then a very simple and in the end compressible system, just free electrons with the Fermi surface. What are some of the other compressible systems we know about? Well, another one is a solid. So you could imagine that your system spontaneously breaks translational symmetry. And now if you change the chemical potential, you just solid will just compress a little bit, uh, and you'll add more particles first at the boundary in some complicated way. But this is also a compressible system. Uh, but we're not particularly interested in this here in my talk, uh, because again, you know, we understand solids, uh, and, uh, and, and breaking translational symmetry uh, is somewhat difficult in using ADS-CFT, although there have been several studies in that direction. And, what, and the final compressible system, and really the, the third and final familiar one, is a superfluid. So if you have bosons or you have fermions, they can pair and both condense. Uh, and that both condensed state is also compressible uh, and, and uh, as a superfluid. And one common feature you should have seen in all three compressible systems is that they have gapless excitations. Uh, you need the gapless excitation to allow Q to vary smoothly as a function of mu. Uh, they're not necessarily protected by any broken symmetry. Uh, for in a Fermi liquid, they're not. Uh, but we, there's a universal characteristic of the low energy excitations. So in a superfluid, the only low energy excitation is sound mode. Uh, in, in a solid, it's the phonon. And in a Fermi liquid, the only low energy excitations are composites of the fermion particles and hole around the Fermi surface. Uh, and, and that characterizes universally all of these compressible phases of condensed matter physics. OK, so now there are some more exotic compressible phases that have been studied in, in recent years. Uh, and I'm going to in include them by this, uh, uh, this conjecture, I guess. Uh, which is that, so we're going to exclude, for now, uh, compressible phases that break translational and global U1 symmetries. So I'm excluding superfluids and solids. What's left over 
well, certainly Fermi liquids, but there could be other, other phases that we call non-Fermi liquids. Uh, but here, this conjecture state is that even if they are non-Fermi liquids, they must still have Fermi surfaces, but of a rather somewhat different character. And once you have Fermi surfaces, this compressible system should also obey the Luttinger relation. So this is a, a relation valid for, even for systems with gauge interactions uh, to all orders in perturbation theory relating the total sum of all the areas of all the Fermi surfaces you have to the expectation value of Q. And so the, the, the examples of non-Fermi liquids that are starting to be understood but not completely in condensed matter studies are all examples in which you have Fermi surfaces where the quasi-particles at the Fermi surface carry not only the global charge Q, but they also carry uh, additional gauge charges, and that gauge field is in some strongly interacting deconfined phase, uh, and that leads to strong damping of the excitations uh, near the Fermi surface. Okay, so, so that's a, a summary of a global perspective of compressible phases. So next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a model familiar to, to most of you and just turn the condensed matter crank uh, of these ideas on, on understanding some of its possible phases. So I'll take a model that many people have discussed in this conference, which so is just the ABJM theory. Uh, so it's got a bunch of fermions and bosons that carry both global and gate charges. Uh, the global charges are the R symmetry, and it's got a large amount of supersymmetry. So I'm going to take the system and just add a chemical potential that couples uh, to one of the SU4 uh, global charges. Now this immediately breaks the supersymmetry, uh, and so really I want to take, use that as a license to add all sorts of terms cons consistent with the reduced symmetry. And just to simplify my life, I'm going to just uh, take very simple realizations of all these complicated globe and gate charges. I'll just make the gate charges U1, and SU4 also has a U1. And so taking a lot of license in this direction, but I believe preserving the essential structure, uh, here's a, a model I'm going to look at. So I take a system with both a global and, and a gauge U1, and I have fermions and bosons, which carry uh, just positive U1 R charge, uh, but opposite, equal and opposite gauge charges, and no supersymmetry. And then I add a chemical potential, which couples to the global U1 charge. And I simply ask, what are the phases of this theory in two plus one dimensions? Now, one of the things that the, uh, uh, that the gauge forces can do clearly is bind, is form mesons, which are gauge neutral combinations of B and F. Uh, and it's useful, at least in mean field theory, to introduce that meson as an elementary field, but it's not essential. Uh, and so it's a meson state, which is gauge invariant, but carries U1 charge too. So if you want to see an actual Lagrangian, here it is. Uh, here are the fermions and bosons coupled to this U1 gauge field A. Uh, this is like the quartic term, which is also present in the ABGM model, a highly simplified version. And I just add in, for, for convenience, uh, a mesonic excitation, which carries global charge 2. Uh, and here's my, global, here's my total charge Q uh, for, for this theory. So we just go ahead now and apply standard condensed matter methods and try to explore the possible phases of, of this doped, of ABGM theory in a chemical potential. So what do you get? Well, first of all, you do get a Fermi liquid. And in this language, this Fermi liquid would just be a Fermi surface of these gauge neutral particles. So only the C particles, which are the bound states of B and F, uh, will contribute. And this relation must hold uh, that the total area of this is given by the charge, is a factor of two here because the C carries global charge two. Uh, and once uh, this happens, then uh, the U1 gauge theory is, is not protected by any matter fields that low energy gauge charge excitations and it uh, will lead to flow into a confining phase. So this is the familiar uh, confining phase, which would be a Fermi liquid. But a more interesting uh, deconfined phase is the following where you get a Fermi surface of the F fermions. And there's F plus and F minus, so there's two of these, and that's what accounts for the factor of two here. Uh, and, and these F fermions, however, are coupled to a U1 gauge force. They also carry gauge charges. And this is what we call a non-Fermi liquid, uh, where the U1 gauge theory is in a deconfined phase. And this is to remind you of that. 
So there's also low energy gauge bosons, which are, wouldn't be present in a conventional Fermi liquid. So this is a new phase uh, of gauge charged particles forming a Fermi surface. So this has been studied a lot over the last 20 years, this type of problem in condensed matter, starting with the uh, interest in the quantum Hall effect at nu equals one half. Uh, and, but, the, but it's a problem that continues to be of interest even very recently, and here are our current understanding. So when you take, first of all, it's important to note it's, there's really little difference between abelian and non-abelian gauge theories once you have a Fermi surface. Uh, they're equally complicated uh, and look very similar in their properties, in fact. Uh, the the, the, the A-cube term is essentially irrelevant, uh, and most of the infrared singularities come from this Fermi surface uh, excitation. So as you learn in, in freshman electrodynamics, uh, anytime you have charged particles, you screen the forces. Well, that's true for the longitudinal gauge forces, uh, but the transverse fluctuation, the current current fluctuations, are not screened, but they land out damped. And so this is some kind of low energy mode, which has dynamic critical exponent z, which we can compute in various approximations, but it's certainly greater than one. Uh, what was shown by Sung Sik Lee and uh, extended by us was a realization that in the one over n expansion, this theory is strongly coupled, and at the very least, you have to sum, even at n equals infinity, sum a whole set of planar graphs appropriately defined. So it's at least as complicated as non being engaged theory and probably much more complicated. Uh, but nevertheless, through various uh, self-consistent two-loop analysis, which we have some reason for believing, uh, we believe that the structure is stable uh, provided the gate charge assignments are, don't uh, make it unstable to pairing of the electrons, uh, of the fermions, and there's a non-Fermi liquid broadening of the quasi-particle pole. So this is the, the new uh, compressible phase, which I believe will eventually be revealed also emerging in the gauge gravity duality studies, although not yet. There are a lot of various hints which I will uh, present shortly. Okay. So that's the non-Fermi liquid phase. And you can also get more complicated phases where you have both regular Fermi surfaces and non-Fermi liquid Fermi surfaces. And now the sum of these has to add up to the total charge. And finally, there are superfluids, of course, where the fermions can pair and condense. Uh, and, and so now, even in the very simplest set of parameters, you try to work out a phase diagram. It looks extremely complicated. But the basic ideas are hopefully clear. The main actors are Fermi liquids and these non-Fermi liquids and superfluids. All right, so, so that's a lightning summary of some uh, broad perspective on our understanding of compressible phases in condensed matter physics. So let's now try to turn the crank and apply this, address the same questions using gauge gravity duality. All right, so here the basic actor in many studies uh, is this Reisner Nordstrom black hole. So what you do in the very basic study, you start, first of all, with just with the Einstein action, which is dual to the conformal field theory, and then you just add some charge to it. So the way you add the charge uh, is the chemical potential. It's basically you, you change the boundary condition on your, you add a gauge field and you change the boundary condition uh, on the gauge field. So there's electric flux coming out to the boundary. Uh, and if you just solve this pure gravity electromagnetic theory, the flux has no way to be absorbed. It goes right through the horizon. Uh, and, and there is a solution of these, uh, of these equations. The saddle point is, in fact, the Reisner Nordstrom black hole generalized to anti de Sitter space. OK, so now you could use this theory as, as a tool for understanding various properties. So one of the first basic properties of this theory is that if you go to very low temperatures, uh, the black hole doesn't disappear. But what you get is an uh, extre uh, uh, extremal horizon. Uh, and the near horizon metric uh, is ADS2. There's an ADS2 factor with TR being this radial direction, uh, plus uh, the X and Y directions of, of, of the black brain. And this seems to be universal low energy theory uh, of any compressible system, at least in this classical gravity approximation. So now you could take this background and now source various uh, matter fields on the boundary, as was done in the very earliest days of ADS-CFT for ADS-4. So you take a scalar field and a direct fermion and then compute its green function in this boundary. So easy to say, but it took, it took some time before uh, it was, that, that was sorted out. 
Uh, in particular, there was this work of Faulkner et al., uh, which really gave a very elegant solution. And the general solution looks like this. So you sold some matter particles in this, in this state, uh, which has a, a net electric charge on it, uh, and you compute the Green's function. And at low frequencies, this Green's function factorizes uh, in, into functions of k and omega. And the reason for this factorization is directly connected to this factorization right here between time and space. And so here, the momentum dependence is generally smooth, and all the singularity is as a function of frequency. And these are all various computable functions, which depend on the geometry and, and the bulk mass of the particle. And this probe is, is, is stable as long as the bulk mass is large enough. All right, so this is true for both bosons and fermions. So now, for bosons, we know that uh, this has to be positive for this geometry to be stable. Uh, and, and I'll discuss in a few minutes what happens when this changes sign. And for fermions, however, this is allowed to change sign. And so when this changes sign and goes to zero, you have your Fermi surface. So this was the key observation of Faulkner et al., uh, showing you that you get a Fermi surface, uh, which is beautiful, but the, but the damping of the quasi-particles given by this term here, which is determined by the ADS2 geometry, uh, is, well, is, is rather, it doesn't naturally fit into realistic models, although it does map onto, as I'll discuss very quickly, uh, some approximate solutions that were studied earlier in condensed matter. Uh, but more seriously, the problem with this solution, ultimately, uh, is that it doesn't obey uh, Luttinger's theorem, that if I just take this Fermi surface for fermions, and for bosons, it's an even bigger problem, uh, because there are no Fermi surfaces, uh, then how are you going to add up the charge density and make that equal to the global charge, which, if you were taking a large n limit, would be of order n squared. Uh, and so the obvious answer or a conjecture is that there are, in fact, hidden Fermi surfaces around. We just haven't probed them because they're associated with particles that also carry gauge charges. They're not visible in terms of the gauge invariant operators with which you're probing the theory. Okay, how am I doing on time? Oh. Okay, about 20 minutes, is that correct? Okay. All right, so, so I'm going to spend a few minutes now trying to understand what does ADS2 cross R2 mean uh, and, and what is the significance of the solution. So, what is, so here's a simple condensed matter interpretation of ADS2, perhaps familiar to you, many of you in a different context. So here, let me take a simple conformal field theory, uh, uh, which is, say, graphene of free electrons, uh, and then I'm going to dope it. I'm going to change the density. But rather than just changing the density by adding a chemical potential, I'm just going to put one particle, not a whole density, just one. In fact, I'm just going to remove one. So if I remove a particle, then here's, I'm moving my way towards doping it, but just do it one at a time. Then if I look at this situation, then what you find is that uh, near this vacancy, you get a zero energy uh, quasi-bound state. So the low energy dynamics near, near this point uh, will then involve excitations uh, of this mode near r equals zero, which are just identified by a fermion field, which has no spatial dependence. So if I want to now think about the, the full theory, I have then this impurity that I removed on graphene, represented by chi, and this will couple to some bulk field, which I just written here as phi, uh, with some coupling constant k. Now in some cases, if you cho choose this conformal field theory correctly, uh, not the case for free electrons and graphene, uh, but in, in some other not so different cases, uh, you can show that what happens is that this coupling K flows to a fixed point. It becomes universal uh, when the bulk is, uh, is conformal. Uh, and so that state that you obtain when, when you have a universal coupling of, in, of this point-like degree of freedom in two-dimensional space uh, is what, what I believe is the basic physics of ADS2. Uh, and in fact, if you take the same geometry but replace the CFT as a three-dimensional uh, super yang mills theory uh, and then add a super spin here represented by, again, by chi coupling to the bulk fields of super yang mills A and phi, uh, then in this case, you can take the large end limit as uh, these people did and indeed find that the low energy physics of this, in this case, is some sort of deep brain, I guess, uh, is described by ADS2. So that's what ADS2 is. It's really the physics of a single impurity interacting with a bulk uh, conformal system uh, in, a, in a universal way. 
All right, so now what we have in, in, in the near horizon geometry of uh, horizon Nordstrom is ADS2 cross R2. And what does that mean? It's, it really basically means that every side has become an impurity. So, and there's one simple way to get that kind of result. Suppose I take my interacting electron system and put it on a Bethe lattice. So this is a graph that keeps going forever with coordination number, in this case, two. Uh, but now I take the limit of two going to infinity. Uh, and then you can represent this problem in what's called dynamical mean field theory, where you focus on any site, say the central site, and call it your quantum spin or your impurity. And the rest of the sites are your environment. Uh, and then you solve the problem of the site coupled to the environment. Uh, and then finally, you impose the self consistency condition that the environment was actually made up of the same sites. So that's, in a nutshell, what's called DMFT. Uh, and it re reads to a whole set of structures for various Green's functions, which in the end end up looking very much like ADS2 cross R2. Uh, in particular, you will find, just like in ADS2 cross R2, non zero ground state entropy, density, uh, the frequency and momentum dependence I showed earlier, uh, various conformal invariants. Uh, and in this case, because you have this additional self consistency condition, the condensed matter realization, you can also fix the masses of the fermions, and they turn out to have these, these marginal values. Anyway, so that uh, is then my interpretation of ADS2 cross R2. Uh, it's as if your interacting system has self consistently broken up into little impurities, which are uh, then interacting with some bulk conformal field theory. So this is very useful and may be uh, useful as some intermediate temperature description, uh, possibly. But uh, I don't think it's the ultimate description of the low energy physics of any compressible system. So we have to really move beyond this. Uh, and, and that's the, the last part of my talk, uh, on, which is the focus of really much research, ongoing research in the last two years on, on improving our understanding of compressible systems and so that in the, eventually we'll then understand the connection between this analysis and the analysis I summarized in part A, uh, which uh, you know, may be incomplete, but it does represent a lot of knowledge that uh, has been built up over the years. Okay, so this is the, the basic actor then in these finite density systems. Uh, as I said earlier, you, you simply add some global charge density, and it seems to just go beyond the horizon uh, with an electric flux, which then influences any other particles you might want to throw in. So the basic strategy taken by many people, in fact, almost everyone, uh, is to now put in explicitly the matter Lagrangian uh, and include that in determining the geometry. So you want to put in sufficiently like matter because at least in the classical gravity approximation, if this matter is heavy enough, nothing changes. But if it's sufficiently light, then what can happen uh, is that if you put in a, chart, a particle here, uh, it, can, uh, you know, it can shrink a pair create and have negative charges go this way and positive charges go this way. Uh, and so in the end, you can essentially neutralize the charge beyond, beyond the horizon, if there is a horizon. So what you typically find is that the horizon disappears, uh, and you get charge density throughout the bulk, and eventually there's enough electric flux created by this bulk charge density not the charge beyond the horizon, uh, to equal the chemical potential that you imposed on the system. All right. So when you do this, uh, you're also going to change the geometry. And if you just now solve these equations, which has not really completely been done yet, even in the classical uh, approximation of gravity, uh, but in certain approximations that I'll review in a minute, uh, if you solve these equations in, in, in a certain set of approximations, in all the current studies, what you find uh, is that ADS2 cross R2 geometry at low energies uh, is replaced by what's been uh, somewhat unfortunately called a Lipschitz geometry because Lipschitz's work has absolutely nothing to do with this kind of physics, really. But anyway, uh, the important characteristic of this geometry uh, is that you have this dynamic scaling exponent z. Now, if z was 1, this would just become ADS4. Now, z is typically greater than 1, and so time scales somewhat differently from x and y. And if you take the z goes to infinity limit after a suitable uh, rescaling of r, uh, that becomes ADS2 cross r2. But anyway, from the rules of uh, uh, ADS-CFT, 
this kind of geometry suggests that there's some low energy excitation in the infrared uh, in your boundary theory, which has omega scaling as k to the z. So there's a, some uh, scale invariant excitation uh, with dynamic exponent z. Uh, so what is that excitation? Well, one natural candidate uh, is this, in fact, this transverse gauge field uh, that I mentioned earlier, which is present in the non-Fermi liquid state. Uh, but that correspondence is something that really needs to be made more precise and not fully understood. Okay, so that's the metric one gets. Now, for bosons, this back reaction has been very well studied, uh, starting with the work of Gupser, and I believe Gupser gave a talk at previous strings meetings. So I, I'm simply just going to put up the names of a number of people who worked on this. Uh, and the basic thing that happens is that when you put in a bosonic field in this L matter here and I'll allow it to condense, then indeed you get, you lose the ADS2 cross R2 geometry and get the Lipschitz geometry. And you end up describing or on the boundary looks like a superfluid for all practical purposes, except uh, there's this little nagging difficulty that you've still got this Lipschitz geometry at low energies, uh, or even some cases with z equals 1, indicating that there's some other set of low energy excitations which actually don't appear in most superfluids. So perhaps it's some, uh, uh, you know, you have a kind of a two-fluid system with a superfluid and then perhaps some other non-Fermi liquid excitations hiding somewhere. Uh, so these are the kind of things that are still remain open, and I think What's going to settle these questions ultimately is perhaps uh, some very careful top-down theory where you start from a consistent decoupling of, say, some supergravity theory, and, and then you end up with a final result that uh, doesn't have extraneous modes floating around that you don't understand. Uh, for the fermions, uh, this analysis has only been done in the past year or so, uh, but it's done in, in, a, in a particular approximation that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, but again, you find the same type of Lipschitz geometry at low energies. Uh, and uh, modulo these concerns of the Lipschitz metric, uh, it looks like a Fermi liquid, that you get Fermi surfaces that at least are qualitatively similar uh, to, to weakly interacting electrons uh, and obey the Luttinger count. So let me just uh, review this calculation, which is uh, very recent work of some of these uh, people. So, so the basic idea here, as I said, is to take your matter field and have it back react uh, on the rise and notch flow metric. Uh, and this is done in existing work in the Thomas Fermi approximation. Uh, that is, you assume that the local chemical potential determines the local fermion density, which then has a certain pressure from the given by the fermion equation of state. And then you feed that back in uh, to the stress energy tensor of Einstein's equations. So when you do that, you end up changing the metric to get the Lipschitz metric at low energies. And then you now look at Gaussian fluctuations about the state, which means you look at the fermion Green's function. So you, typically you find that the fermion uh, is propagating in some potential, which is determined by a combination of the electric field and the bulk, the charge density and the metric. Uh, and it has, a, in, over some range of momenta, it has this shape. And so you find that there are these uh, zero energy bound states that you get for special values of K. And it turns out those bound states correspond precisely to where the Fermi surfaces appear uh, in this problem. So here, going beyond the Faulkner et al. solution of a couple of years ago, you're re really f including in some self-consistent approximation, in this case the Thomas Fermi approximation, the feedback of the matter fields on the metric and, and, and the charge density. So this was the, uh, the, the basic picture that you got in the Thomas Fermi approximation. Now you put in this, uh, if you wish, the Gaussian corrections, which are exponentially small in n, in a sense. And what you find is that you get a very large number of Fermi surfaces with some Fermi wave vectors Kfn of n is about n squared. And in, indeed, the area of that this is really the, I think, a very beautiful result uh, obtained by these people, uh, that the total sum of areas of all of these Fermi surfaces is indeed the charge density Q uh, uh, that you imposed on the system. So, so this, this is satisfactory. At least you're satisfying the very basic relation of any compressible system. Uh, but uh, from a condensed matter fifth perspective, it's somewhat unsatisfactory. You've got too many Fermi surfaces. You don't really want a system with so many Fermi surfaces so closely spaced, especially as n goes to infinity. And 
it's also possible that these extraneous low energy excitations you're seeing have nothing to do with the Fermi surface. They have to do with these anomalously small Fermi surfaces at near k equals zero. And those pretty much are dominating a lot of the spectral functions. Uh, all right, so you can see that there's ways to go before we have a consistent theory of any non-Fermi liquid or even Fermi liquid phase. But just looking at, back at the progress in the last two or three years, I think it's quite remarkable how far people have come. Uh, and, and I suspect this is going to continue for the next few years. Uh, so this is, I think, a really fruitful line for interaction between condensed matter and string theory. And eventually, perhaps, we'll have emerged with a deeper understanding of, of strongly interacting compressible phases uh, of matter. OK, so uh, I guess I'm pretty much done. A little bit early, OK. But uh, here are the, I'll spend a little bit of time in the summary then. Uh, so I, my talk was divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, as I said, was just discussing systems which are conformal, like the Bose-Hubbard model. There are also other systems like graphene, which I have mentioned obliquely, or various quantum magnets, uh, which in the end uh, can be shown to be conformal at low energies. So they're not supersymmetric, though, in any conceivable experimental realization. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the spirit, the way ads safety was applied to QCD, um, here we can forge ahead and get quite a ways uh, and, and get new insights onto the finite temperature dynamics uh, of the strongly interacting system that wasn't available before. Uh, and, and really the best way to think about this is almost all previous analysis, essentially all, was in a way based on the Boltzmann picture. You had to decide you know, what was your particle and what was not, and then just write down some sort of Boltzmann equation for that particle, even though it's not very well defined. Uh, and the virtue of this approach is that it's, it's completely complementary to that. It's the opposite limit. Uh, the complete anti-Boltzmann picture is the ABJM model because it gives you a frequency independent uh, conductivity. Uh, and the hope is that this, these methods will be extended to more complicated situations of which we have very few results, like nonlinear transport and non-equilibrium transport, and perhaps eventually connection to some experiments. Uh, then in the second part of my talk, I talked about compressible quantum matter. Uh, and here, the basic actor in many studies was the Reisner Nordstrom solution. Uh, this is the very simplest metric you get when you put a source of system with a chemical potential. Uh, but it has a number of artifacts, uh, including finite ground state entropy and seeming violation of the Leibniz theorem. Uh, but I showed you that these artifacts correspond actually quite neatly to various solutions obtained in condensed matter physics from dynamical mean field theory. <coughs> and so give a ni <coughs> natural physical interpretation <coughs> um, of, of these strange features. OK, so then you, start, then you added, looked at methods you might lose this rather strange geometry. So one way to do that is to allow a scalar to condense, uh, for which there's been a, a large amount of study by uh, starting with Gupser and Herzog and Hartnell and, uh, and Horowitz. Uh, and in this case, the low energy theory has a Lipschitz form, uh, possibly with z equals 1, uh, indicating that uh, there are additional low energy excitation that, in a sense, are not present in a generic superfluid anyway. Uh, then I think some of the most exciting work in the last year has to be been looking at the fermionic case. And here, the fermionic back reaction also leads to very similar physics, where you get this conventional phase uh, of a Fermi liquid obeying uh, the Leibniz theorem, uh, in addition to these somewhat unwanted uh, Lipschitz excitations. Eventually, I, I, the hope is that all of this will come together, uh, and, and we'll have a theory of these fractionalized phases possibly coexisting with superfluids. Uh, and, and the dream is that this deeper understanding of fractionalized compressible phases will have something to say about what in experiments we call strange metals. So I'll just end with one experimental slide in the strings conference. Uh, so here's a summary of a variety of uh, measurements of essentially all quasi-two-dimensional systems, uh, most of which, except for this one, show relatively high temperature superconductivity, but also some sort of quantum critical point associated with um, antiferromagnetic ordering in all cases. And, in and if you look in all of these systems right near this quantum critical point in this finite density regime, um, you get this compressible state here in red. And this is the red region is where this expo d log rho over d log t is 1. Uh, 
Uh, so that's called the strange metal because in a Fermi liquid, this should be two, uh, which is the region, which is what you see out here or out here uh, and out here and here in, in, away from the critical point. Uh, and so there is a strange metal region which is ubiquitous and, and a glaring example of a compressible phase that we don't really understand. Uh, uh, one of its primary probes is resistivity, which is a bit unfortunate because resistivity is a complicated quantity involving momentum conservation and Umklopf scattering, which is certainly absent from any uh, ADS-CFT analyses so far. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, excluding that, uh, keeping that caveat in mind, perhaps there are other properties of strange metal uh, that the ADS-CFT will eventually give a deeper understanding of. So that's really the challenge for the future, and I'll conclude there. Thank you. So are there any questions that you would like to ask? I'm afraid my question is very naive, but there aren't any problems about incompressible uh, quantum systems that, oh. for which ADS CFT is relevant or gauge gravity duality. Well, incompressible, you mean gap states or not not conformal <laughs> states? Well, uh, I guess they're you know the, the most prominent gap states are the quantum Hall states, for example, and uh, I think they at least at the basic level have a fairly good understanding of them. Uh, the finite temperature dynamics of gap states are relatively simple because the excitations are very dilute at any temperature. Uh, where, you know, it's possible there are more exotic quantum Hall states that eventually, uh, more exotic types of gap states that ADS-CFT will teach us more about. But uh, at least from my perspective, that's not as, as burning a question as some of, some of these issues. Anyone else who wants to ask a question? Okay. If not, then we thank the speaker and have a coffee.